my first spiritual mentor when I was in my 20s talked to me about Bible study and speaking, and he exhorted me to um, not use what I may have learned from Scripture, not to share what I may have learned before or what I may have spoken on before or what somebody else has spoken on. He called those stale blessings. He said, don't, don't rely on stale blessings. He said, I always go to the Word and ask the Holy Spirit to give you fresh insight. Now, I have opted to dust off a few stale blessings from time to time, and I was almost tempted to do that this week because the topic really kind of, well, it kind of hurt. <laughs> it was a tough one for me, and I appreciate Henry allowing me to, to share his pulpit, but this week I was kind of wondering why I said yes. Um, our sermon series is about living in harmony. And the theme Henry asked me to address is how we respond to criticism. Now, for me, that's a tough one. That's really a tough one. Before we look at the passage of Scripture that was chosen, we need to talk a little bit about the nature of criticism. You know, as we deal with people in our life, we often encounter criticism. It usually comes in two forms, positive and negative. Now, positive or constructive criticism is important because it is helpful. It offers us guidance, it encourages growth, it pulls us into a forward progress. It usually comes from a trusted or a respected source, uh, perhaps somebody we know, and it helps us rethink our priorities. It helps us to challenge our decision making. It influences our actions in a positive way. Unfortunately, most criticism we deal with is negative. It said that 80% of the criticism that we encounter is negative. That type of criticism usually comes from an emotional response of somebody else to something we've said or done. It hurts. It attacks. It erodes our confidence and self-esteem. And it's a form of judgment isn't it? Psychologists call this projected criticism, and I'm going to touch on that a little more in a moment. Now, as much as I'd rather talk this morning about constructive criticism, the focus here in the admonition to live in harmony is deal with negative criticism, and that's what we find in the scripture reading this morning. Why do people criticize? Well, projected criticism comes from a need, usually, to build oneself up. It is usually intentional, but it may not be intended to hurt somebody else. And, but in building ourselves up, very often, we've got to take somebody else down a notch, don't we? It serves to denigrate a person's work or even more so their prestige, their reputation, their self-esteem. That's where it gets difficult for me, because as much as I put on a show of being outgoing and confident, I really deal with issues of self-esteem. And I hide it pretty well. And because of that, I hide as well how much criticism can hurt me. That negative criticism disparages and belittles people. It's an emotion-based act. That kind of emotional response to a situation or remark is particularly common um, in our modern culture. People used to share their thoughts. If there was a difference, um, you resolve that difference of opinion by a respectful discussion of ideas. But that's changed. Uh, quite a few years ago, um, the pastor in Philadelphia, Dr. James Mon Montgomery Boyce, noted that we've shifted away from rational discussion of ideas, and we've moved more towards emotional response. Um, people no longer tell you what they think. They tell you how they feel. 
If you seek somebody else's opinion, very often they'll answer, well, I feel like whatever. Insert here. And that's become very typical in our, in our culture today. Unfortunately, when we use feelings as a gauge for our positions, we no longer focus on resolving the difference, the conflict. We don't work towards coexisting harmoniously. Criticism becomes a means towards winning. Now, understanding where criticism comes from, we need to consider today's passage in 1 Samuel in the context of what was happening in that, that passage as it leads into chapter 10. So picture, it's 1050 B.C. Israel's been led by the prophet Samuel. But Samuel's getting older, and he's hoping that his sons will pick up where he's, he eventually leaves off. Unfortunately, his sons are not nice folks. They are dishonest. Uh, they're selfish. They're not appropriate to be leaders of Israel. So the people called for Samuel to appoint a king or anoint a king for them. God's response was, well, they were rejecting God's kingship by asking for a king. Enter Saul. Relatively unknown, tall, handsome, from the very small tribe of Benjamin, and through a series of God-directed events, encounters Samuel. And Samuel, who in turn is following God's specific instructions about Saul, anoints Saul as king over the people of Israel. So we pick up the story then in chapter 10, when Samuel calls together all of Israel to appear before the Lord. And that kind of comes in about chat, uh, verse 17. So let me read. Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord of Mizpah and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, your God who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities. And you've said, no, appoint a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and your clans. And when Samuel had all Israel come before by tribes, the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. And then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and Matri's clan was taken. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was taken. But when they looked for him, he wasn't to be found. Here's a man with some self-esteem issues here. So they inquired further of the Lord, has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, yes, he's hidden himself among the supplies. They ran and brought him out, and as he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. And Samuel said to all the people, do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. And then the people shouted, long live the king. And Samuel explained to the people the rights and duties of kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people to go to their own homes. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose heart God had touched. But some scoundrels said, how can this fellow save us? They despised him, and they brought him no gifts. But Saul kept silent. Bless this reading of God's word. At the very end of the passage, some people that the writer refers to as scoundrels, they're not happy with what happened. And they're critical of Saul. You know, it's a typical biblical story of the people ask for something, they get it, and then they're not, not happy. You can't really come back at God, so what they do is basically come at Saul. And they don't 
this passage doesn't tell us any detail about what they said, what they did, but we can guess that they were criticizing Saul in the choice of him as their king. We can assume that those people are like people today. Situations change, but human nature doesn't. And when people are unhappy with something, they've got to find a way to criticize. We still reinforce our positions by being critical of others. Listen to a quote, a quote from an article published in Psychology Today on April 18, 2014. It offers an insightful look in this very small quote at where criticism comes from. Criticism is an easy form of ego defense. We don't criticize because we disagree with a behavior or an attitude. We criticize because somehow we feel devalued by the behavior or attitude. Critical people tend to be easily insulted and especially in need of ego defense. That hit me right in the heart. So where has this taken us? As with any Bible study, we look at Scripture to better understand how we should live our lives. So how might we respond to criticism? Well, let me offer three options. First, we get defensive and we fight back. An eye for an eye. I get attacked, I punch back. That fighting can take many forms. Resorting to insults, belittling others, defaming someone, gossiping about them. We look for ways to undercut them and sabotage their efforts. And we use whatever means necessary to do it, whether maliciously talking about them to others, spreading the lies and the gossip, or in today's world, hitting social media. Unfortunately, when we stoop to their level, we literally do go down to that level, and they win. A section, second option for responding to criticism is to seek insight from Scripture. I would hope that's what I would do. And even a cursory look through Scripture gives us some guidance. We look and we apply God's Word, we exercise wisdom, and we try to follow the direction that we find. Proverbs 10.8 says, The wise in heart accept commands, but a chattering fool comes to ruin. One way to exercise that wisdom is to overlook the offense. Proverbs 12.16, Fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. Proverbs 19.11, A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Jesus ignored criticism. He faced it constantly. He faced insults. But he encouraged us to be meek. I love that word. I once did a study on that word. People think weak means, meek means weak. No. Meek is properly defined as power under control. Isn't that a great word? Power under control. If we're to respond with meekness, we hold back. We don't say the things that we really emotionally want to say. We exercise self-control. Another response to criticism is self-examination. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. That's from 2 Corinthians 13.5. Finally, the third response is the one that we see here in this passage today that comes from Saul. Our response should be, as Saul's was, no response at all. Verse 27, we see that Saul didn't even answer. Perhaps he recognized his critics to be the scoundrels that they were. They weren't worthy of a response. 
My wife, my wise wife Lori always says when something is said that bothers me, she says, consider the source. That's a tough one. <laughs> but really, consider the source. Is it somebody you respect? Is it somebody you trust? Then is there an element of truth in that that you need to hear? And put the emotional response aside. It said that 10% of life is what happens to us. 90% is how we respond. Sometimes the best response is no response at all. Don't let criticism defeat you. Don't look at yourself through the filter of the criticism that somebody throws up in your way. One of my favorite presidents is Theodore Roosevelt. I, I've said before, I love history. I love the history of our different pres presidents and what they've brought to our country. An old TR, he must, have been a, he must have been a unit. And he said this in a speech that was entitled, The Man in the Arena. This is a man that faced a lot of criticism. He says, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there's no effort without error and shortcoming. But credit belongs to him who does actually strive to do the deeds, who spends himself in a worthy cause. Now, I said this is a tough subject for me. The study wasn't made up of stale blessings. It really was putting a finger on areas of my life that are very sensitive that I don't share with most people, but they do hurt. And I have to confess, um, I'm inclined to respond to criticism with uh, snarkiness, <laughs> sarcasm, um, progressively with gossip and complaining, saying things that are better left unsaid. And again, the wisdom of my wife, she always cautions me, be careful what you say. Because she knows in our history that I've said things that probably weren't too smart. I can tend to go silent. And I can tend to mope, be sullen, and fume. But instead of dealing with it, what I'm doing is bottling it up and letting it simmer. And then it just takes a little bit of a trigger, a little bit of a spark, and I lash out in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong person. And even if I don't say something, Lori's always told me, my body language speaks volumes. I tend to rant. I tend to complain. I'm, I'm a classic complainer. But these are all my defense mechanisms towards criticism, and they're wrong. What's your reaction to criticism? Do you get defensive? Do you throw up those barriers? Or do you stay calm? I mean calm on the inside, too. Do you strike back? Or do you listen for that grain of truth that maybe spurred that criticism? Do you stoop to the level of your critics, your attackers, or do you respond with grace? Is the criticism coming from somebody you trust? If so, they care about you. There's some element of truth that you need to get a hold of. What prompted it? So don't make it personal. Seek feedback. Acknowledge where you might be wrong. Seek God's insight forgive, and move forward with grace. Amen.